Uh, the, 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 the good news is we have a quorum. The bad news is you have to put up with me for the rest of the day, and I have to apologise for the chairperson who is away on business and cannot be here. Uh, we have apologies from um, the, 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 the chairperson, and um, we also have to bring to attention the proceeding. Uh, welcome our, our, our viewers and, uh, on, on TV. And uh, <coughs> the next part of it is um, um, we need, um, bef before we start, uh, everybody knows the, 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 the rules. We will try to get through as much business as possible. It's going to be difficult because there will be several votes in the course of the day. So we'll try to uh, keep our work within, within confines so that we don't have to overlap as, uh, in, and do the best that we can. It's difficult to do, but we will, we will do the best we can. And I would appeal to the uh, members for, for their cooperation and help in that regard as well. And just to give you a advance notice, I will have to leave early early because I have a medical appointment. That's okay. But I will contribute the best I can. Yes. And Chair, I, I did send a note through to, to the, uh, the, the, the office uh, of this committee. I have a further meeting this afternoon in the Midlands, so I will have to leave early, and apologies okay. for that in advance. Okay. Chair, in that context of a sort of poor attendance and in and out, which is nobody's fault, that we kind of in public session, register that and thank them because they travel far and their yes. paper we're going to, we're going to do, we're going to do even that. if the attendance is down. We're going to do that, yes. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Debbie yeah. McGrath. I have amendments in the finance bill and I have to be in the most of the evening, so I'm not going to be here that long. And I'm uh, swapping with Senator Mullen and my Rosa slot. Okay. Oh, yeah. that's okay. As long as that doesn't delay me in the light of the numbers. It's okay. No, no, no. We, uh, we, 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 we'll we'll, 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 we'll proceed. We'll proceed. We'll proceed. We will proceed. We um, <clears throat> now um, on, we want to, to uh, um, welcome our, our, our witnesses, uh, and we have Professor Eva Pikeart and Professor Sheaf Givers. That pronunciation might not be uh, accurate, but uh, it's the best we can do <laughs> at the moment. Uh, members are requested to turn off their mobile phones, as the, the, uh, even when on silent, they interrupt and, and, and uh, uh, play havoc with the, with, the, with the recording. And also, um, we, um, we want to, uh, um, the, the, the normal uh, citation in relation to um, um, the Defamation Act. Witnesses are, uh, are protected by absolute uh, privilege by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence of this committee. If you're directed by the uh, committee uh, to cease giving evidence in relation to the particular matter, and you continue to do so, you're only thereafter uh, entitled to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed only that in evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and that you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person or person or entity, by, uh, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Members also uh, mind the long-standing rule of the Chair to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official by name in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I think that's important in order to do the business we have to do. Uh, and I would add to that, you know, that as we have done so far, uh, we like and try to conduct our business in a non-confrontational way, uh, both in our dealings with, with, uh, with uh, our, our witnesses and in our dealings with, the, with each other, in accordance with the best parliamentary practice. And um, I now uh, like to call on our witnesses, whoever wishes to proceed first, uh, if they might uh, um, give us your uh, opening statement. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, maybe I shall end, start with a short introduction of myself, my background, for your information. Um, I have a background in law and sociology. I was professor of health law for more than 20 years in the University of Amsterdam, both in the Faculty of Law and in the Faculty of Medicine, the Academic Medical Center, where my colleague, uh, Professor Pike, is also working. Um, was former editor-in-chief of the European Journal of Health Law and of the Dutch Journal of Health Law. I was more than 25 years member of the Dutch Health Council advising the government on health and ethical and legal aspects of health care. And um, more in relation to the subject of today, I was responsible for the first evaluation of the Abortion Act in the Netherlands, which took place 20 years after it was issued in uh, 
1985, in, in 2004, 2005, we <coughs> conducted a nationwide study on how it was applied and how it functioned. Um, thank you for the information to inform you about abortion law and practice in the Netherlands. We have given you an overview of the Dutch situation in our joint paper. Uh, I think you have received that before. And in this opening statement, we will now briefly summarize this paper, focusing first on the law, that is my part, and then briefly also on actual practice in the Netherlands. Um, my colleague, uh, Professor Pikert, will do this second part of the practice. First, a few words then on the Termination of Pregnancy Act as we have it now, and as it was enacted in um, 1984. Uh, terminating a pregnancy is a crime under Article 296 of the Dutch Penal Code. So the Abortion Act is based on the criminal law and is an exception to the basic prohibition in the criminal law. According to the fifth paragraph of that article in the criminal code, however, abortion will not be punished if carried out by a doctor in a hospital or abortion clinic with a license in accordance with the Termination of Pregnancy Act. In, in common lay terms, we call it the Abortion Act, and I will do so in the next few minutes. Uh, that act was adopted in 1981 and came into force in 84, as I already said, after a long history and after more than 10 years of public and political debate. Several bills were introduced into Parliament and only the last bill was accepted by a vote 38 to 37, so it was a very narrow acceptance of the bill at that time. Um, the two conflicting values that had to be accommodated in it were clearly expressed by the government du du during parliamentary proceedings. Um, the government said the bill is based on the view that women who are in a situation of emergency due to an unwanted pregnancy should receive help. But also, at the same time, we consider the termination of unborn human life as such a serious act that it is only acceptable if unavoidable because of that emergency. And this means that the physician, uh, the woman, and others that may be involved before the decision to terminate need to act with the utmost care and in awareness of their responsibility towards unborn human life and of the consequences for the woman. End of, end of quotation. <coughs> At the moment, uh, 93 hospitals and 15 clinics do have a license to terminate pregnancies within the limits set by the Abortion Act. And such, such licenses are granted by the Minister of Health to establishments that satisfy statutory requirements relating to the quality of treatment in terms of medical competence, facilities, and also psychological care. The directors of these establishments must submit periodical reports to the healthcare inspectorate about the number and some characteristics of patients they have treated. And the figures are published in the annual report of the inspectorate. Abortion, uh, it's important to stress this, is not seen as a normal, as a routine medical procedure, but as one that may only be carried out on request of the woman if her circumstances leave her no other alternative. Now I would say a few words about the key provisions of the Act. Um, they relate to careful decision making, because that is the substance of what the Act is about. Termination may only take place if a situation of emergency of the woman makes that inevitable. An emergency then refers to the psychological state of mind of the woman due to the unwanted pregnancy. It does not require uh, the risk of physical or mental injury. The Act does not provide substantive general criteria for assessing whether or not the situation of the woman amounts to an emergency. The legislator has adopted this approach because the decision to terminate a pregnancy must be taken with due regard for the individual circumstances of each case. 
Both the woman and the doctor are responsible for the process of reaching a decision. All the decision as such is ultimately made by the woman. The physician shall assist the woman requesting an abortion in making up her mind. And for that purpose, he or she, the doctor, must provide her with appropriate information about other solutions to her situation and, to, and see to it that, first of all, her request is made and maintained freely and without undue pressure from other persons. And secondly, that she insists on that request only after careful <coughs> consideration. And that brings me to the reflection period. In order to ensure sufficient reflection, the Act requires a reflection period of five days between the initial request of the woman and the eventual termination of her pregnancy. An exception to this is only possible when the health or life of the woman is at risk. Now, some other provisions of the Act, I will not elaborate very much on them. An important point is that health professionals are never obliged and cannot be obliged, for instance, by employers or other persons, to perform an abortion and conscientious objections must always be respected. Furthermore, physicians carrying out abortions must keep medical records on why, in each case, they decided to terminate a pregnancy, and if requested, they must give the inspectorate access to these data. And mention should also be made of the obligation to provide adequate care after the termination has been performed. This includes not only medical check and psychosocial assistance if needed, but an obligation of the establishment where the abortion takes place to provide information and education concerning the prevention of, of, prevention of undesired pregnancies. Um, then a few words on what does not fall under the Act. I mentioned three th different things. First of all, so-called morning after methods, such as use of a morning after pill, are not considered as a way to induce an abortion and are therefore not covered by the Act. The reason is, of course, that methods to prevent conception, there are methods to prevent conception, which means that, that there will be no pregnancy. The second situation is when abortion takes place as an unavoidable side effect of a necessary medical intervention or if continuation of the pregnancy would endanger the life of the mother. Although formally such an abortion still comes under the penal code, no prosecution will take place because the doctor involved is considered to have acted in a situation of force majeure or however you would call it in, in English and he or she can invoke the defense of necessity in legal terms resulting from a conflict of duty so he, there will not be criminal proceedings in such a situation. In the, third, the third thing is a bit more complicated. It is about inducing an abortion within 44 days after the first day of the last menstrual, menstrual period. That is 16 days overdue. That does not come under the Abortion Act. And that is a bit special, if I may say so. And it means that although it still must be performed in a hospital or abortion clinic with a license, formally the provisions of the Abortion Act, including the statutory waiting period and reflection period, do not apply. And why, why this interpretation of the Act? Well, it goes back to the time in the beginning of the 80s when the Abortion Act was being accepted and, and, and came into force, when it most, was not yet possible to confirm the existence of an early pregnancy beyond doubt. And although this situation belongs to the past now, we have far better method, medical methods, and Professor Parker will elaborate on this if, if necessary, uh, this restrictive interpretation of the scope of the Act has survived until today. But I must say that in practice, the requirements of the Act relating to careful decision-making are usually observed also in these early cases of uh, pregnancy. <clears throat> now, finally, the Abortion Act itself does not set a time limit to abortion, but the Penal Code does so. 
according to Article 82a, abortion amounts to a crime against human life if the unborn child has developed to the point where it is able to survive outside the womb, fetal viability, in, uh, as it is called. And on the basis of present medical opinion, this is after 24 weeks of gestation. In practice, a period of 22 weeks is used, if I am correct. And after that time limit, the doctor involved can only defend himself by invoking a situation of necessity and conflict of duties and, and so on. Um, maybe if you allow me, allow me, Mr. Chairman, I can conclude by saying a few words on the evaluation of the act which took place in 2005. Yes. Um, many health, health laws in the Netherlands are being evaluated after four or five years, and then the, the idea is that uh, we should have a look, do they work in practice, are they complied with, and so on, do they achieve their goals. Um, there was not, no such an obligation within the Abortion Act itself. Maybe that is because it was already enacted in the 80s, last century. The way it operates in practice, however, is closely followed, in particular by pro-life groups, we have them in the Netherlands, of course, and some of the political parties who are concerned that the legislation we have is applied too liberally. And to address these concerns, when a new coalition was formed in 2002, it was agreed that the application of the Abortion Act would be the subject of a nationwide study. <clears throat> Well, in 2005, as I said, the evaluation report was published. Its overall conclusion is that the compliance by clinics and hospitals with the Act was satisfactory and that health professionals did what the law required from, from them to ensure that decisions concerning abortion were taken in a careful way. Furthermore, the report concludes that abortion services are available and accessible where needed, and that in general they are of good quality. Uh, one interesting point um, we found was relates to the interviews we had with, with many women who had gone through this process of requesting an abortion and having one, and I picked this out of the 250 pages report, to, to put it forward here. According to the women who were interviewed, the reasons for requesting an abortion are quite diverse. They range from financial and housing constraints to age, the fact that the family is already complete, a broken or a fragile relationship, lack of possibilities to raise a child, and then of course sometimes medical reasons in the strict sense of the word. Most often, there is more than one reason to request abortion. And this is also confirmed in a later study conducted in 2002 by the University of Utrecht, uh, com commissioned by the uh, Ministry of Health in the Netherlands. The outcome was that most women that were interviewed said that their final decision was the result of a number of reasons and should be seen against the background of their present situation in life. All of them according to the report, experienced the decision to terminate their pregnancy as a very hard one, and some of them as the most difficult decision in their life. Um, and then finally, last year, a new evaluation of the Abortion Act was planned. It should have taken place this year, but it has been postponed because the government uh, has fallen and has been replaced last month by a new government and the parliament decided to allow the new government to uh, decide on how this new evaluation of the abortion act should proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And um, Eva, do you wish to uh, make your opening statement now? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Eva Peikert. I'm a professor in obstetrics, in particular prenatal diagnosis and obstetric ultrasound at the Academic Medical Center of the University of Amsterdam. I was trained as a gynecologist in the medical center Alkmaar, in, that's a general hospital, and afterwards as a, in the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, that's a tertiary referral center. I was trained as a general gynecologist in all aspects of the specialty. 
Before and during my residency, I did my PhD on prenatal screening for chromosome anomalies, and our work later on contributed to the national introduction of prenatal screening in the Netherlands. Following my residency, I did a two-year clinical fellowship in fetal medicine at the UCLA University College London Hospital. Once I came back to the Netherlands in 2005, I started working again in the academic medical center as a consultant in fetal and maternal medicine. I've been head of the fetal medicine unit since 2010 and was appointed professor in 2016. I'm involved in numerous committees of the Dutch Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Since the introduction of the prenatal screening program, I've been a member on several working parties concerned with the quality of care of the program. And I've been advising the Ministry of Health on several abortion issues. My presence here has been requested to answer your question about Dutch abortion care. The abortion care is embedded within the ethical framework of patient autonomy and is completely woman-centered. The objective of Dutch abortion care is to have a thorough and comprehensive process without creating any obstacles. I will brief you, take you through the statement we have already received. I will not go through it extensively, but I understand some of the people are following this online only and they don't have this, so I will just go through it. I'll skip certain parts, so if you can't follow me, that's correct. Since 2016, there's been a national cooperation agreement between the Dutch Association of Abortion Specialists, the Dutch Psychological Counseling Service for Questions of Unintended Pregnancy, Adoption and Abortions, which is called the FIOM, Dutch Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and the Royal Dutch Association of Midwives, and which I forgot actually is actually the Dutch Society of General Practitioners. I see that it's not there, but they're also involved in this corporate agreement. Women with an unplanned or undesirable pregnancy and doubts about continuation of the pregnancy will generally go to the general practitioner. So this is how who is involved, which professionals are involved. In 56% of cases, women, the general practitioner will be the first contact. He or she may counsel the women about her options may refer the woman to the abortion clinic, a gynecology, or for further psychological counseling. They have their own national guideline, and I think I've also uh, put, that. there's an English version, which you have somewhere out there. In 25%, women go directly to the abortion clinic, and it's the first contact. The abortion clinic doctor may counsel the women about her options, they may perform the procedure, or they may refer the woman for further counseling. And then the other 25% either goes to a midwife or a gynecologist or some other professional. If the pregnant woman goes to the midwife, the midwife may never be the referring physician. She, she's not legally a doctor. So she should refer the woman and then the GP or the gynecologist has to refer the woman again. Gynecologist may be the first contact or other doctors like for instance, women with a cardiac problem, you know, uh, in which it's unsafe to have a pregnancy, an ongoing pregnancy, maybe also referring people. Now, there's general considerations in case of unplanned and undesirable pregnancy. Now, one of the first things you ask is whether there was a pregnancy done, or whether you should repeat it. Then you should always ask if the pregnancy was planned or unplanned. Now, that seems un contradictory, but it's, of course, not always that a planned pregnancy may become undesirable. An unplanned pregnancy may become desirable and vice versa. Ask about the circumstances leading to the pregnancy and whether or not the woman was on contraceptives. Mention there is always a choice and a dilemma in case of unplanned pregnancy. Ask about a dating scan. If not, then please have one performed, preferably transvaginally. If the woman's determined to have an abortion, please mention that on your request to the um, sonographer. Is the partner present at the consultation and explore whether the woman was not forced by the partner or the person sitting beside her or um, that it's a voluntary request. Explore whether there has been sexual abuse. Be aware of cultural and religious factors. Ask whether there would be a risk of genital tract infections 
but in case of uh, abortions on request, as opposed to abortions due to prenatal diagnosis, we always test for sexually transmitted diseases in the Netherlands. We always discuss contraceptives. If the, what kind of contraceptives the woman's going to use after, the, after she has had the abortion. Is the request consistent? Or does the woman seem to panic and potentially may benefit from more time to make a decision? If so, refer the woman for further counseling. And when we're referring a woman for an abortion, always document the first date of the abortion request. There is, of course, there are several websites. I've added one. Women can go online. There is a choice and help choice, and they can go through it and then can do it. Then there's also a couple of questions you should always ask. Of course, are you certain about your decision? Seems obvious, but you have to ask it. How did you reach this decision? Is this your own choice? Um, have you considered other options? Would you like me to explain the options? Do you need help to make a proper decision? If the partner is present, please also ask the partner. And in case of ambivalence, it's, it's important that the woman understands that she's responsible for her own choice. Ultimately, she is the one to make the decision. There's no one who's going to take this decision for her. Do not force a woman into making a decision. Try to help her making a choice. Do not blame the woman for being ambivalent. Consider the emergency situation of the woman. If the woman remains ambivalent, refer the woman for further counseling and to the FIOM, which is the Dutch Psychological... That's actually the FIOM is also the agency that helps you, uh, helps people further who consider adoption. And they actually, when they are, once they go on with adoption, they help these women. Well, time is very important in case, in any case of unplanned pregnancy in view of the method of abortion. Uh, so once a woman is referred, a quick appointment is mandatory. So within, preferably within a week, but at least within 10 days. From the moment the woman indicates she's in considering an abortion and the actual treatment, a reflection time of at least five completed days is mandatory in the Netherlands. This reflection time is not mandatory until gestational age of six weeks plus two days, which is the 44 days uh, Chef mentioned after the first day of the men last menstrual period. However, 65% of these women do have a reflection period of more than five days. There's several ways to terminate the pregnancy, a surgical one, a medical one, and a combined one where we use medication followed by surgical procedure. Women may choose when they have their abortion and how they have their abortion, although their choice is, of course, also uh, uh, dependent on gestational age. Women over 16 years do not need parental consent. Women between 12 and 16 years do require parental consent, but we can withhold parental consent if we think it's, it's a reasonable argument. The majority of abortions in the Netherlands, 90%, is carried out in abortion clinics. Then the Dutch Healthcare Inspectorate produces an annual report which statistical information about terminations performed in the Netherlands during the preceding years. And the last report was for 2015. Um, due to the manner in which the abortions are get, in, in which these data are gathered, it, um, it's aggregated data, so it's, there, it's not possible to correlate between the different components of the abortion registration. So a couple of numbers, so just so we know what we're having. In 2015, we had 30,000 abortions in the Netherlands. Almost 4,000 of these were from women from a foreign country, 13%. Of all the abortions, 8,500, which is 28%, were before 44 days. So these are actually, don't even actually, are considered under the Abortion Act. 16,000, so 50%, were performed before seven weeks gestation while uh, 9,000 almost were performed between seven and 12 weeks. Thus, 80% of all the abortions were performed in the first trimester before 13 weeks. 
But the major, uh, did I say something about that? No, I'll come to that. The majority of women undergoing an abortion are between 25 and 30. Only 83 pregnancies were terminated in women younger than 50 <clears throat> years. Uh, the total number of pregnancy terminations in teenagers was 3,000 in 2015, and that has been decreasing slowly over the last couple of years. And this is also reflected in the percentage of uh, teenage uh, pregnancies in general, also those that go to term. Um, and this is very low compared to other European countries. Since 2007, all pregnant women in the Netherlands may undergo prenatal screening. They are offered to combine tests for screening for Down syndrome, Edward syndrome and Patau syndrome. And as of 2017, NIPT has been added as a first trio test to screen for the above mentioned trisomies. Moreover, every woman is offered a 20 week scan. Since 2011, it is possible to address whether an abortion is the result of prenatal diagnosis. In 2015, only 1,000, a little bit over 1,000 wool abortions were performed after prenatal diagnosis, and a majority of which was in the hospital. So we do know from the aggregated data that more than 30% of the abortions in hospitals is due to prenatal diagnosis, compared to only 0.5% in abortion clinics. However, we do not have any knowledge on diagnosis, nor is it possible to correlate the date with gestational age. It is likely that abortion due to prenatal diagnosis will be carried out in the second trimester due to the time it takes to get a definite diagnosis. Thus, we can assume that around 20% of the second trimester abortions is due to prenatal diagnosis. Some final considerations. Of all women undergoing abortion, 75% leave the clinic or hospital with a prescription of contraceptives. Since 2012, it's mandatory to provide sexual education to all school-going children. This starts in elementary school. Till 2011, contraceptive have been reimbursed for every woman. Since 2011, only women up to 21 years get reimbursement. Abortion is free in the Netherlands. Um, as long, it says, that's wrong in the statement, it says it's for everyone who's legal and insured. It's not true, it's for everyone who's legal and has a social security number. It is subsidized care. So the costs are not reimbursed by the insurance company, but it's subsidized by the Ministry of Health. For foreigners or people living illegally in the Netherlands, costs vary between 380 and 940 euros. There are certain centers, such as the Academic uh, Medical Center, that are subsidized separately by the Ministry of Health to take care of these women. So if women really, really are in a very difficult position and cannot afford an abortion, uh, our hospital will provide an abortion and are, and they're reimbursed a different way. I don't know exactly how it's regulated, but there's a subsidy for that as well. Thank you very much for your Thank attention. You. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, we very much appreciate you being here and giving us of your time. And uh, in order to be helpful to everybody and because uh, our, our, our uh, uh, witnesses are not uh, everyday uh, 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 English speakers. Uh, speak a little bit slowly, maybe, uh, just to accommodate for better understanding. And also, and also, we will try to accommodate everybody uh, in every way possible in terms of time. The first speakers have the 10 minute slots, uh, and then it might be better to start off by asking one question, maybe. The, 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 the speakers might ask one question, and we get the answer to it when we get into the, to the, to the mainstream of it. And the number, the first speaker we have on the list here is Dep Senator Jay Buttermer. Can I just first of all thank our witnesses, and I won't take 10 minutes. Um, Dr. Reva, can I just ask you to explain what exactly a consultant in fetal medicine actually is and what you do? My main job is basically I, um, I, I spend a lot of time in the uh, ultrasound department and 
basically what I do is I get women referred to me that have been scanned elsewhere and they're referred because there is a suspicion of a fetal anomaly. So I either rule out or, um, well, um, how do you say it? Confirm. Confirm that there is a, a fetal anomaly and then I counsel parents about what is going on. I counsel parents about which additional tests could be performed to come up with a uh, final diagnosis. And then once we have a final diagnosis, I, I spend a lot of time counseling people about how to proceed with their pregnancy. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor um, so Givers, yeah, thank you. Um, in your presentation, you spoke about the prenatal screening program. Um, could I just ask you maybe to expand this more about that and explain how it's worked and some of the outcomes from that, please? Uh, prenatal screening, I, but I think Professor Pikett is more competent to answer that sure. question. Yeah. So, could you, sorry, because I yes. sort of... I, I apologize yeah. for, my, yeah. for my cock accent. Um, prenatal screening yeah. program, could you just explain how it works? What are okay, the outcomes how it works. and, and yes. expand this moment on the presentation, please? Yes, well, we have a, we were actually uh, uh, quite late with introducing a prenatal screening program in the Netherlands. We introduced our uh, program in 2007, and it has two things. What we do, we offer every, we offer, well, actually, the way it is, women are first asked if they want to receive information about prenatal screening. If the answer is affirmative, we offer so there is a there is a, uh, a, a right not to know. So that's very strongly believed that if women don't want to know, uh, ha don't want to have all the information, that you shouldn't be giving it to them. So then the woman has to say yes, I would like to have the information, and then you counsel them that there is a, a possibility of having screening for chromosome anomalies. That used to be the combined test. We still do have the combined test, but since April 2017, we now offer the non-invasive prenatal test, which is just a bit of blood where you can see if the baby has, or it's likely that the baby has uh, trisomy 21, 18, and 13. Uh, the NIP, it's called the NIPT, and I will refer to that like that. NIPT is more sensitive than the combined test in detecting uh, in detecting fetal trisomies. However, it lacks, on the other hand, the, the, the ability to um, see other problems in the fetus at an early stage. And then every woman is um, counseled about 20-week scan, and they're offered the 20-week scans, which we try to perform uh, nowadays around 19 weeks, because we feel that if there is an anomaly, you need time to actually do further investigation, and investigations take time, and it's better if you have a little bit more time so women do not have to rush into making decisions. Um, the uptake of screening in the Netherlands for the uh, for combined tests were always around 40%. It's very regionally dependent, so in the area where we work, in Amsterdam, it's quite high. In more uh, Rural area is quite lower. In the northern north of Holland, it's quite low. So it depends a little bit on where you live. Uh, we thought that once we would introduce NIPT in the Netherlands, that women would just rush and everybody would have NIPT. None of that has happened. The number of the uptake has stayed more or less the same, maybe a little bit higher, but it's not like everybody's rushing into. One of the arguments is that uh, the combined test and NIPT in the Netherlands is not free. So you have to pay uh, for the combined test, you pay 169 euros, and that's for the whole test. And for NIPT, you pay 175 euros, and the rest of the NIPT, because it's more expensive than that, is actually being paid for by the Ministry of Health. It is it is a study, so it's all a study protocol, and the license goes till the 1st of April 2020, and then they will evaluate how it works or not. So um, women have to pay for that. However, the 20-week scan is for free, and it's for it's so. And it's we have like um, if you have 
healthcare in in the Netherlands and you get a treatment or something, you have like your first level of 385 euros, which you always have to pay back. There are certain things that are not in that, and the 20 weeks key is not in that. So it's, if that's the only treatment you get that year, you don't, you know, the insurance companies will pay for it. And um, the uptake of the 20 week scan is it's quite difficult, but we because we have everybody in in a database who has the scan, but then it's more difficult to figure out who isn't in the database. But we assume that the uptake is up around 95 percent. One last question, Carla, um, which is kind of linked to, you, you spoke about the regulatory system that's in operation. Um, I know we have a vote in the Dáil, Carla, there. So uh, in terms of the regime, can I just ask, can you explain the regime? Um, and does it, does it serve the doctors well in dealing with, with, with their female patients? And, and my last question then linked to that is, can you identify any issues with your law currently that may limit your practice? In other words, how could you, how, what would you do if you could improve it? Um, just, I'm, I'm sorry, we, we, we were interrupted by a vote in the House. Oh, and, the bell. Uh, we apologise for that because we weren't aware that this might be the circumstances uh, when, when uh, you opted to uh, uh, come before the committee. And I would ask the members as well to be equally patient. We cannot do anything about it. Uh, the, the, you, you could theoretically have half the members participate, but then there could be questions asked about that at a later stage. So I, I, the sitting is now suspended. Or uh, ten minutes or whatever it takes.
um, and how is it operating and in the context of the outcomes and in terms of the way it, 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 women are looked after as in, in, the, in the regime. And then just in terms of the actual the Dutch model, uh, can Board of Our Witnesses um, outline or identify any issues that with the law as, as it's presently constituted, you know, does it limit, what does it limit in terms of your practice? How can it be improved? Um, what can we take from that? And just to thank them for their presentation. Um, and and I, I'd like to just um, thank Dr. Raver for her, 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 her remarks in terms of the, the work that she does and explaining what she does, because I think it is important that we put that in context, in, in the context of, of, um, of her role and, and her competency in terms of, you know, fetal medicine, I think is something kind of that perhaps we should look at as a country in terms of making that more visible and, and, and explaining it in, 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 in simpler terms to people to understand the competency, the professionalism of, the, of people at like Professor Raver. So thank you. Thank you. Steve? Uh, uh, I will uh, make it start in answering your question. Thank you for your questions, and then Eva will uh, follow on. Um, you're asking about uh, how, how the regulatory system operates, and if I understood you well, it's also about uh, in what position does it place the physicians, and can they go along with it, and what problems may they encounter with the regulatory system as it is. Um, but at first sight, it might seem that the, the law as we have it could uh, deter doctors because abortion is still a crime. And uh, you, maybe you could expect that they would be afraid of uh, performing an abortion. Um, but at the same time, the abortion law is now, has now been in place for more than 30 years. It's broadly accepted. There has been an accepted practice. So um, the provision in the criminal code in itself does not, is not any longer a deterrence as long as you remain within the well-defined limits of the Abortion Act. And the further question is, of course, how is it easy for doctors to, to operate, to proceed within those limits? I think basically it is because um, there is so much emphasis on the procedure of coming to a good decision. We do not have a system with um, substantive criteria. For instance, um, is in this case, um, is in this case there is a medical problem or not, or how serious is it? Is the life of the mother in danger? No. Um, the system is open um, to a large extent, but there has to be a counselling process aimed at careful decision making. So that um, allows doctors to take on board different re reasons for abortion, different motive, different individual situations. And that doesn't make the decision less serious and far-reaching, but basically it's an open system which does, doesn't confine doctors to certain predefined uh, situations. Thank you. Uh, Eva? I think that's it. Thank you. Are there adequately answers? No. no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can do it. Uh, we n next is uh, Senator Ronan Mullen. Thank you for coming here today and uh, for your presentation. Um, just the first thing that, that, that your very interesting presentation brought to light to me, something I hadn't realised, is that the number of Irish women having abortions in the Netherlands is really very small. Um, we've had a narrative in this country that while 3,000, 3,500 Irish women go, going for abortions in Britain. We're often reminded, oh, and there's more going to the Netherlands and so on and so forth. But I hadn't realised that the numbers were actually so small and don't really, in any significant degree, of, uh, impact on uh, Irish abortion rates abroad. Um, I'd like to start, though, by asking you uh, about the Dutch abortion figures, because the Netherlands is presented to us as a country that's you know, very, very low rates of abortion. But from what I can see, it's, probably, it's more accurate to say that Britain and France and such places are in the highest tier, and that your abortion rates are more like Italy and Portugal, in that you're in a second tier of abortion rates. We, the figures presented to the, um, 
to the uh, Citizens Assembly using the UN approach put the Dutch rate at 9.7 per thousand, which would be more than half the Irish rate of 4.5 per thousand. So you're talking about more than twice on that metric. However, the British have the, the Office for National Statistics. Now, they calculate abortions as a percentage of total pregnancies. Do you ever use that approach? Um, the idea being, I suppose, that you, 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 you avoid things that may change from country to country, like fertility rates and so on. And if you look at abortions as a total rate of pregnancies, and I'm taking out the 4,000 of German and French, so putting it at 27,000 as a total number of, in 2015, out of the total of 170,000, you seem to have a rate of about 13 or 14 per cent. Um, whereas in Ireland, one in 20, we have a rate of about 5 per cent. So what I want to ask you is this, to be sure before we examine the D Dutch figures, are the, the third exception, that you, you, the third category, which are not included in the abortion, uh, I'm talking about the early abortions, are they included in, in the figures that you're giving us? Yes. Just yes. to be clear on that. And would you have any idea of the post 24 week number of abortions? Are they also included in the figures that you're no. giving us? No. Could you give us an idea of the total number of abortions that take place after 24 weeks? Yes. Thank you. There were, there has been, with the introduction of prenatal screening, there has been um, a decrease. In the Netherlands, we have two categories of for late pregnancy termination. The first category is the lethal. So the, the infant that once it's born will never survive. So it's lethal. And then we have the category well, where we feel that if the baby would be born it wouldn't warrant medical um, you know, treatment because it would be felt that it was basically inhumane or unnecessary or whatever, you, however you want to frame it. So for the first category, we ha had 18 in 2004 and it has dropped to three in 2015 and the 2016 report is not in here, but it's been recently published, and there were two. So it's dramatically decreased with the introduction of prenatal screening, mainly because a lot of the, uh, the, lot of the diagnoses that were in there were the trisomy 18s and the trisomy 13s that are now being picked up by prenatal screening. For the category two, it has been, um, uh, it also dropped a bit, but it's more likely like one or two per year. Being born or, 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 or being Ter aborted? Terminated. Okay, so over 24 weeks, how many abortions a year terminated? In two, Netherlands? three. Okay, N nothing more, just a very small number. Very small number. Would you be able to say then in relation to, we have a particular tradition here in Ireland, we, you know, Down syndrome, children with Down syndrome are perhaps more cherished here than in many other countries. We're very proud of our International Special Olympics. Many people testify to the joy that uh, uh, Down syndrome children bring into their lives, how they change their lives in a very positive way. And there's been a lot of concern and a lot of debate about the fact that in Britain over 90% of children diagnosed in pregnancy with Down syndrome are, are, are aborted. Uh, it was, I think Iceland has received, reached 100%. The Great and the Good in Denmark plan to be Down syndrome free by 2030. That's the quasi-official position. Have you figures for how many children diagnosed, what percentage of children diagnosed with Down syndrome in utero are aborted in the Netherlands? Yes, I have the figures, but it's not, it's, it's the problem with our database because it's a national screening program and I have to, I'm very sorry about it, but still not working properly, so we don't have all the outcomes, but we have a, Basically, what's going on in the Netherlands, what I told you before, is that the uptake of prenatal screening has been about th around 35%, and that is for the uh, first trimester screening for fetal trisomies. So we have done a study, if you want, I can send you the paper. There's been a paper by Bakker and all, and I was involved in it, and we actually asked women what were their reasons. And one of the reasons was that a lot of women in the Netherlands actually felt that Down syndrome was not something we should screen for. So I think 
that reflects our way of counseling women and really giving them their own choice and really, um, you know, we, our, our healthcare is really, I think, very much based, what I said before, is on patient autonomy. What do women want? We don't force anything upon them. In terms of if you diagnose a fetus with Down syndrome, that's generally women who do want screening, yes, the terminations rate will be around 90%. 90%. Yes. Thank you. Um, now, you refer in your own um, going through the guidelines or the general considerations. You uh, talk about asking if the pregnancy has been correctly dated with a scan. In case of doubt, perform a scan. When referring for a scan, please mention whether it is an undesirable pregnancy. Now, I have to tell you that a lot of people in this country, and not just people of faith, contrary to what you might have heard, but people who have a, a human rights vision that includes born and unborn, um, would regard the language of undesirable pregnancy as shockingly euphemistic with fairly chilling historical parallels, but that's my view. You won't, I won't be the first to have said that to you. But can I ask you, why when referring for a scan is it relevant to, re to mention whether it is an undesirable pregnancy? Well, basically, that's, that's, that's um, the fact that we actually we have, you know, said decision-making. We're more and more focusing on what, what women want. In this case, I'm talking about women. I'm a gynecologist. I don't really generally deal with men. But uh, so we asked them whether or not, if you know that it's an, that the woman has become pregnant, and she's considering a termination, I think it's good medical practice to actually ask the woman whether or not she wants to see the scan. And if you know as a GP that the woman's actually considering pregnant, you may be considering an abortion, I think it's good medical practice to inform the professional you're referring to and provide them with as much details about that woman as medically necessary. Surely you should give the person the straight option of seeing a scan. It might save a life. Yes, but it could also be a very traumatic experience and she might never, you know, have a very... Uh, I don't know. That's, I think that's speculation. But in the end, with your abortion rates that are somewhere between two and three times our rates, depending on how you count them, isn't it the case that it really is an abortion on request system? You, 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 you pitch it very much in terms of emergencies, but is anybody ever refused an abortion? Have you any figures on that? We have no figures on that, and uh, to be honest, I, if, uh, I think we do have abortion on request, yes. So all of this talk about you, what you're really talking about well, in I your think, system. You know, the, the re, you know, I really would, I really would like to add something to that. And, and that is what, what really bothers me. And I've been doing this work for, very, for a very, very long period of time. And I have never come across a woman who makes the request lightly. These women have really a lot of difficulties. It's not, I'm going on a vacation and it doesn't suit me. And I seriously object to the fact that abortion on request is something that people do because there, there's always a bigger argument. They have problems, they have their own, their, whether it's financial, whether it's housing, whether it's whatever, but it's not a light decision. It's, it's really it, not. Isn't it fair to say, though, that nobody really claims that you know, abortion is a light decision. I mean, most people who speak about this issue, whether they see two lives to be protected or just one, We'll, we'll, we'll acknowledge that this is a crisis. With the last speaker in before you yesterday evening was a person who opposes abortion, who is a child with very severe disability. But she spoke very empathically about how every case is different and how there's so, so many crises. But in the end, isn't it the case that you only see one life to be protected? As long as the abortion is wanted, you really don't see yourself as having any duty of care to the unborn child. Is that a question? Yes. Isn't it the case, I'm asking you? Do you acknowledge that that is the stark truth of your position? Um, yeah, please. I think we have a duty of care to the unborn in, in, in terms of that uh, decision to have an abortion 
and to get to perform an abortion Even should should not be taken lightly and has been taken in due care after due process of consideration. But you're talking about ending a life, and what you're really saying that that is an entirely subjective test. And as long as a person insists that it's an emergency, you have no, there's no reality to your duty of care uh, to the unborn, surely, if all you're saying is, please make sure you've made up your mind. You don't even offer to show a scan. I don't know about offering. Last, but, but last, last reply, uh, Senator. No, we, 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 we're running in next. That, that's the, if you wish to reply. Uh, I think I answered the question about the scan, so yes, I don't I think, think so I'll have to go into that again. All right. And All right. Thank you very much. We next speaker is Senator Paul Gavin. Thanks. Indeed, Cahillock. Um and thank you to you both for your presentations. I found them. Uh, Again, absolutely um, full of uh, facts and, and a very broad and detailed um, setting in terms of the health framework in relation to terminations in, in, in your country. So uh, I, before I ask the question, I, I just do want to correct one thing, because um, the previous speaker, Senator Mullen, has given the impression that, that we know what the amount of people going for terminations is in Ireland. In actual fact, we don't. And the reason we don't is because, while we have a figure uh, of people who register in Britain, which is around 3,500, that figure doesn't include uh, the amount of women who are taking abortion pills, uh, which estimates vary, but the estimates seem to be around 1,500. It also takes no account of the people who don't give their true address. Uh, and a number of people do that. They have a very good reason to, because if they give an address in the UK, they may well be able to access treatments um, without having to pay. So. To be frank with you, we don't know what the abortion figures are in Ireland. We do know that thousands of women travel each year, just, just to, to correct that point. Um, in terms of the, I mean, I, I have to say it struck me that there is a very ethical framework in place. That's the first thing that struck me in terms of the, the Netherlands. And I want to ask you about how is abortion health care viewed by the Dutch population as a whole? And how are women considered in all of this? Um, Thank you. Well, yes. I think there's wide acceptance of the system that we have. And um, whereas in the 80s, when the Abortion Act was enacted, uh, I told you already that it was a narrow vote, very tight. And um, we were very happy that we achieved something in this field, that there was at least a minimum of consensus. Nowadays, I think it's fair to say that uh, a large part of the population, the far majority, uh, are, are satisfied with the system uh, we have. It remains a, a, an issue of political debate at the same time. And as, um, that is also illustrated by the fact that the annual report of the um, health inspectorate we mentioned already is always dis debated into Parliament every year again and always the same questions come up, how does it operate, and is it in accordance with the intention of the legislation, and so on. And I mentioned also already the plans to have a second evaluation and the debate about how that's, what the main focus of that should be, and so on and so on. So there is continuous, uh, well, debate and, 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 and uh, concern about how it works and how it should work. It, it remains a controversial question, whereas it, in practice we have a system that is widely uh, accepted. Um, yes, maybe you want to... Yeah, I would like to add something. I mean, I think it's regarded as uh, what, I said, uh, what I said before about the, uh, you know, the um, ethical framework. Mm -hmm. I think most people, men and women, feel it's actually really a female decision. So it is the patient, what I said, woman-centered decision, and they're, you know, that they should have the, the right to, you know, to make reproductive choices, and that includes abortion. So in effect, your, your system is based on, on, on a system of a principle of trusting women? I think so, yes. Okay. Uh, can you give us some information about the health outcomes for women who access abortion health care in the Netherlands? 
Yeah, I find it very difficult. What, what, what do you mean by health outcomes? I mean, is it safe or is yeah? Because I mean, there is just to explain the, the, the context of the question. There is an argument from a, a strange minority um, who will argue that abortion is somehow, you know, uh, overwhelmingly bad for women's health and has long-lasting consequences. Mentally, well, I think for abortion example. is actually a very, very safe procedure. I mean, there's different, there's different methods. I mean, there is the, the what I said, there's the pills, and then there is the, the surgical ones. And what they, what they found is that if you, if you have uh, the surgical ones, you have to dilate the cervix a little bit. So what they're doing now more and more is that they prep the cervix first with pills, and then they do the surgical procedure. But all these procedures are uh, relatively safe. Of course, if you progress a little bit later on in, in gestation, if you look at the annual report, I mean, there are, uh, there are complications, of course, there, but it mainly has to do with the fact that if you're later in pregnancy, let's say around 20 weeks, there is a 20% uh, chance that your placenta will be retained, so you have to go to the emergency room to to remove the placenta. And the the, the thing is, it's not very clear to hospitals how to register that. So we, should, you know, it's all registered as a complication, while in fact it's just, you know, the procedure because that's how things are. So I I, I think it's a relatively uh, safe procedure, to my knowledge. Uh, I don't think we have any maternal deaths from the procedure. Thank you. And I'm just curious, could, could you tell us, if you have this information, that is, about the Irish women that, that visit abortion service providers? We, we're very familiar with, with the women who are forced to go to Britain. Um, and as you've said, the, the, the very small numbers in, in terms of the Netherlands. Do you have any data in relation to them? We don't. The problem, that's what I said, it's all aggregated data and I've been trying, you know, to convince them of doing it differently so you could actually correlate, you know, like, uh, for instance, if a abortion was because of prenatal diagnosis, you would like to know, like, when were the abortions? So you know a little bit what's going on. And now the only thing we can do is make assumptions. So, uh, you know, the, we have 35, what is it, or something, Irish women on 30,000? I have no idea where they are in that thing. And I understand, that, absolutely. My last question, I, I'm sure a lot of people are thinking about this. We are struck by, by the very low rate of abortion uh, in the Netherlands. And, and as you've re related, uh, you have a very extensive program of, of education um, and contraception. Could you expand on that? Because clearly whatever you're doing in the Netherlands is, is very successful. And there are obviously going to be some lessons for us here. Well, we, I, think, I, I think we maybe we could do even better, to be honest, because I would really like, uh, I really would, uh, I mean, if I can sort of reflect on our own system, if you would like improvements in one way, I think prevention is better than, you know, to have to treat it. We all think that. I don't think anybody disagrees. In that respect, I think contraceptives should be, you know, reimbursed for everyone. I think contraceptives should be free, whether you're 40 or, or, or 18, okay? So I think we're doing a good, I think health and sexual education is very, very, very important because, you know, if you don't do it, you know, children will go online anyway. Everybody has a smartphone in, and to be honest, what you sometimes see on, on social media is maybe not how you want your kids to be educated about, you know, sex. So I think it's very good that we have a system in the Netherlands where it's actually mandatory. And I'm not saying like, you know, at your discretion when you're in elementary school, no, there is a program. You need to show it to people. You need to see what you're teaching kids. Uh, Parents are involved. For instance, I was asked by the school to give sexual education. Of course, my kids said, if you go, we never go back to school. So I didn't, I didn't dare to go in. But I mean, I did volunteer to tell them a little bit. And you just explain it to them, you know? So I think that, that helps. Certainly. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator uh, Nedesalud. Thank you, Chairman. And again, I'd like to welcome you both. And thank you for coming before us and for presenting a very frank and informative uh, paper to us. And I particularly welcome the statement by Professor Eva that uh, your approach to, to this whole question of abortion is women-centred, which I think is the way um, it should be. And I think it's, it's, it's the, thing, the mindset that is starting to, to gain uh, a lot of um, momentum in our own country, rather belatedly, uh, I must admit. 
But I have just one or two brief questions, Cahill. One has to do with the legislative, legislative situation in the Netherlands. And Senator Mullins may have touched on it earlier. There's a lot of very strong language in the 1981 Act, which I understand has survived any reviews that took place. Um, harsh language even in, in, in reference to abortion as being a crime, punishable, only as a last resort. Yet, at the same time, there is quite clearly a very liberal abortion regime in the Netherlands. So I, I'm trying to put those two things together. And in some way, does that language reflect some sort of social divide in, 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 in the Netherlands on the question? And just finally on that one, has the 1981 Act ever been endorsed by the people of the Netherlands by way of a referendum? Um. <laughs> No, there has not been a referendum on the abortion act. I think if there was one, uh, I tried to say this before, then it would be uh, widely accepted or, or endorsed. Um, the language is, as you say, well, to some extent. Uh, I think in, in, in several countries, maybe, maybe in most countries of Europe, the criminal code is still the basis when we talk about abortion, and, and abortion is... Uh, only allowed within specific circumstances spelled out in national laws. And in the Netherlands, um, we have uh, this concept of emergency, which was already mentioned. And um, it was an important issue when, the, during the parliamentary debate in the 80s, how this concept should be applied. And um, the final agreement on this point was that uh, the law should, need, should not go in further detail uh, when uh, you could say that an emergency existed. And this was deliberately to take account of the fact that a number of the situations in which uh, a woman might be in the situation of despair because of an unwanted uh, pregnancy, unplanned pregnancy, could be so diverse that the legislature refrained from going into substantive criteria and so on. And um, yeah, that explains why um, so many different situations can be taken into account, provided that the decision made is made in due care and after good reflection and so on. So the procedural aspect of the law is more important than, uh, well, the substantive reasons. They are not to be found in the law, except for the very general concept of emergency. Yeah, I won't pursue that one, Chairman. I suppose it's a matter for philosophy rather than anything else. But uh, one other, I have two questions. One final one on the legislation. and. I think I'm correct in saying that um, an abortion will not be allowed to a young person from ages 12 to 16 without parental consent. Yet, uh, should a reasonable argument be put forward by the woman in question, then abortion would be allowed. Now, I'm somewhat surprised that we say a 12-year-old girl, preteen, would be allowed to argue that kind of a case. Uh, does that happen often in practice, and are you comfortable with that? Um, let me say something about the legal situation, then Eva may, maybe follow up in talking about uh, practice. As to the legal situation in, in our uh, law on patient rights, which is of course a more general law, we have a um, majority age for healthcare decisions of 16 years. So when you are 16, you are entitled to decide for your own without parental consent. Between 12 and 16, we have a, a dual system um, for an intervention. We, you need both the consent of the minor between 12 and 16 and of his or her parents. Uh, so um, when you think about abortion, um, you might say, well, that can only take place if parents are also in agreement with it. Uh, we have an exception not only for abortion but also for other medical procedures um, which a minor 
um, continues to insist upon that he or she wants to have it. For instance, a couple of months ago, we had a very debated case in the Netherlands on a young cancer patient who refused further treatment of, of his cancer. And then uh, this exception came into the debate also. But we, also the judge of the court that had to decide on the case, agreed that uh, in such a case, if a minor insists on not having that procedure or on having a certain procedure, between 12 and 16, he or she can, his voice prevails. And that applies also to abortion cases. The problem, of course, is that even if parents do not have to consent, they have usually, they will be informed. And I guess in practice, the person who is requested to um, perform an abortion will um, go in discussion with the minor. Why don't you want to, your parents to have informed? And isn't it, wouldn't it be better if they were informed? But in, um, if there is a strong argument not to inform them, it's, it's strongly in the interest of the minor, the law makes it possible that it remains confidential and the parents are not involved. But it will not take place will only take place after long discussion and a careful decision. Okay, and... We have no data on that. No. But I think it's, it's, it's set up that way, actually, as a protection for the minor. That's the way you should... So it's not... It's, I don't think it's... Uh, the minor doesn't want... You know, the parents don't consent. I think it's more a question of whether or not the minor wants his or, or no, her parents to know. And if you feel that there is a situation that would basically sort of endanger the life of the minor, then you might consider doing an abortion without informing the parents. But it's all very speculative and we don't have any figures. And finally, Cahill, look, uh, Senator Gavin has already referred to so this so um, obviously the Irish cohort is so small you, you haven't done any studies on it but um, for instance there was a, a dip in 2013 very very small number of Irish women is there any have you any idea why that happened and finally is there any aftercare um, regime in place for foreign women generally or Irish women in particular who would have abortions in the Netherlands is, do you do you concern yourself with their aftercare program? I don't think there is an aftercare program. I, I think there is an aftercare program for Dutch women because they are referred back to their for, to actually the the person who referred them to the abortion clinic in the first place. And I know that women that go to an abortion clinic, you know, like I said, twenty five percent will address the abortion clinic straight away, and they will be referred back to their GP, and they will be you know they, the GP has to know that they had an abortion. And then they refer back to the GP sometimes to discuss contraceptives. So there is that kind of aftercare, yes, there is that. But I, I am not sure about the aftercare that's provided for foreign women because generally the women just go back to their, the country where they're from and they don't, you know, they don't attend our services anymore. Thank you. We will. Th thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Next uh, is um, Deputy Peter Fitzpatrick. Uh, thank you, Kaleo. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome the, the, the witnesses. Uh, Kaleo, I have uh, three questions to ask, and uh, I'll ask my first question. Uh, one of the main concerns that a lot of people have regarding abortion is that we would end up like England and Wales, where 90% of babies diagnosed with Down syndrome has been aborted. Your paper talks about how prenatal screening is being offered to women from 2017 so that there is a better chance of detecting Down syndrome in the womb. We know from countries like the UK that increase in screening usually means that more babies with Down syndromes are aborted. A recent article in the Huffington Post news website discussed how more, how more and more babies with Down syndromes are being aborted. It mentioned Denmark, where 98% of babies with the condition are aborted, and Iceland, where that figure rises to 100%. The same article describes how the Dutch Minister for Health at the time was asked if she planned to take any steps in the Netherlands to ensure that the same situation doesn't happen there. Her response was, if freedom of choice results in a situation 
that nearly no children with Down syndrome are being born, society should accept that. My question to you is, do you agree with this statement? Do you think that the idea of a choice is more important than the life of a baby with Down syndrome? Thank you. Who wishes to proceed first? So, yeah, like yeah, can you? Uh, yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's very. It's no, I've been I've been listening. So, uh, the first question was whether I agree with our Ministry of Health about her. That was yeah. what was the first question? The, the, the first one. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about choice. Uh, do you agree with the statement? Do you think do you think the choice is more important than the life of a baby with Down syndrome? The right, to, the right to have a choice. The right to choose. The right, oh, the right to choose. Um, well, you know, from, from my point of view, it's the woman who should have the reproductive choice. Yes. You, you mentioned a word earlier on, a very strong word, a word called protection. And you said, you said there should be protection. I think there, there should also be protection as well for the unborn baby. And I, I, like my, my big concern at the moment is that uh, when you mentioned the word screening, like it happened in the UK, abortion gets more and more and more. Like in Ireland, there's approximately 120 babies born every year with Down syndrome. They're lovable children. And I, I, I spoke to parent after parent after parent, and not one of them would give that child up. So I'm just asking you. I think in the Netherlands we have about the the number of babies with Down syndrome, and there is there are studies on that as well, has been stable over the last years. It's not decreased at all. With the introduction of screening, a lot of people were scared that the number of Down's babies would drop. That has not been the case. One of the reasons is that although there has been an increase of uptake of prenatal screening, that mothers have become older, so older women make maybe different choices than younger women, we don't know, and then younger women, they don't screen because they think they're young and it will not happen to them. But we have, had, we have I, I'm not, but I think about 250 babies with Down born, and it's been, it's, it's a flat line for so, years. So do, do, you, do you agree with the minister's statement? Of I agree with the minister's statement, and I, I agree with her because I think that what she's actually saying, she's saying she's she's talking from the same framework I'm referring to. You know, it's in the end, it's the it's it's the choice of the parents, it's the, it's the choice of the mother, and it's the choice of the father. And it's you know we're all saying like it's it's all the women that want these things, but no, there's also fathers that really are you know have clear ideas about how they're going to live their lives and what you know, fits into their life and whether or not they would, you know, how they see these things. So I think it's, you know, um, the, the, the other side is, is that when you're, when you're saying, well, I think there is patient autonomy and they should be the ones that are actually the ones that have the choice because it's not like we care, you know, it's not like I wish everybody should have an abortion. No, we should, and we think people should be informed. They should know what their, what their options are. They should be counseled. They, what I really do feel that if you do get it, if you do get a child with a disability, whether it's down or something else, there should be provisions. We should be able to live in a society where there is enough medical care for disabled children and not like, for instance, in the United States, where it's a huge burden to have a child with a disability because it's, it will potentially financially, you know, uh, uh, devastate you, so ruin you. So I think we live in a, you, as a country, you have to look at yourself and say, what kind of country do we wish to be? And I think we are a country where everybody, uh, we care for everybody, but the parents have, the parents have the choice and not just because you're the unlucky one that's, ends up with having a baby with one sort of disability or the other, you have to deal with it and because some people think that you should be the one dealing with it. Okay, I, I, I've spoken in this committee about the need for us to look at the positive alternatives to abortion, like providing better support to families and the need to improve the adoption process. I am disappointed that we don't seem to be very interested in looking at ways to save babies' lives, while at the same time providing better supports to women. In your paper, you refer to how women seek abortions should be asked if they are aware of other options and have considered these supports. My question to you is, 
You have talked today about how abortion law developed in the Netherlands since it was first introduced. Can you now balance your talk by explaining how the law has developed to provide an improved alternative to abortion, like, for example, adoption? Well, I know it's, it's, there is a bit of a contradiction here to be in uh, terms of whether or not you should ask the women about certain options, because there is also a tendency to feel that if the woman comes with the request, you should actually focus on the request and not come up with some sort of alternatives with the woman probably would have considered as well. Uh, I have no idea how we should change the law in order to facilitate adoption. I, I'm, I'm not in adoption. I'm not really sorry. I'm not pro probably the person who should, you know, uh, comment on this, to be honest. Uh, I should mention there's a vote in the House again. And uh, this is one of these interruptions that we have no control over whatsoever. Uh, you're coming near the end, so we... we when we come back. You, I just you can, but you're coming near the end of it, so yes, just to that. keep that in mind. OK, uh, meeting adjourned for the duration of the vote, and we shall reconvene.
Did you want to add further to the question? Uh, we're, 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 we're back in session. We have you here somewhere. What time, Hold on a second. Um, Paddy, last. What time we leave in that? What time do they have to leave? Uh, Deputy Fitzpatrick, have you concluded your question? My second question, well, my third question. I, uh, the, th the third one you're coming to now. Yeah. Uh, uh, my third question is, there seems to be, uh, there seems to be a contradiction in what you're saying. On one hand, the law in the Netherlands says that abortion is a serious matter. It is not seen as a routine medical procedure, so you're saying that there is something different about it. But on the other hand, the baby's life is still ended in abortion. So what I am saying is, do you think that an unborn baby has values? Science show that the baby is separated to the mother. So do you think the baby should, have, should get separate protection? You're probably aware that last Friday was the World uh, Prematurity Day, uh, which is celebrated in Ireland and also in the Netherlands. My question to you is, do you agree that there is a real contradiction where on one hand we're living in a world that ends a baby's life through abortion, and while at the same time trying to save other babies if they are born prematurely. Okay. Uh, um, Professor Gavers. Thank you. Um, but, well, we are forming you about the law as it stands in the Netherlands, and I take your question as um, the question, is there a contradiction in it? And you refer to what I was saying about uh, it's not a routine medical procedure. Uh, well, I think there's no contradiction because um, it is not considered, not in the law, not in practice, as a normal medical procedure, as a routine, um, which is only a question of medical expertise, medical technique, and medical norms. Uh, in, in, in my discipline, health law, we say that not all what doctors do can be only regulated by their own norms. Now, some things have to be considered by society, and uh, abortion is an example of that, because there is more at stake than only um, medical intervention to solve a medical problem. And in that sense, it's not routine, it's not normal. And that's why we have kept and will keep, I, I think um, the basic uh, prohibition of abortion in our criminal law. And that is why, for instance, uh, we do have a time limit in our penal code saying that after 24 weeks of gestation, uh, only under very exceptional circumstances, and you have heard the numbers half an hour or an hour ago, uh, we will accept that after that time limit, abortion to take place. So yes, there is um, protection of unborn life and there is respect for unborn life. But uh, the choice of the woman remains in the center. And maybe at the end of the day, in our system, there will be more protection of unborn life than in other systems which do not respect the, the choice of the women concerned. Do you agree there is two, 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 two people involved here, the unborn and the mother? There is two, there is two people. Um, we, we don't uh, consider the unborn as a person in the sense of the law. Um, in our law, um, there is um, increasing protection of unborn life as it grows in the womb of the mother, but it is only considered a person after birth, and then it has full rights a person has um, before that there is some degree of protection but not the same as after that uh, <coughs> you're, you're, you're passing okay okay uh, thank you we move on to uh, central in one thank you chair and uh, thank you both from for the presentation um, when I was reading it, it was, it was really refreshing, I suppose, to see just how woman-centred 
the, the legislation is. I mean, yesterday we had a presentation where a, a witness said that um, our body wasn't ours, it wasn't only ours, and that our hormones are all over the place during pregnancy, and sure, how could we make a decision anyway? So it was nice and refreshing to have this follow today to kind of um, cancel out yesterday's nonsense, really. And um, even though it's woman-centred, and I can see how woman-centred it is, when I look at the five-day waiting period, I'm wondering then, does that come into conflict in terms of some women and their circumstances. So if you look at a woman, say, from a certain socioeconomic background or somebody that in, in relation to domestic violence, and if they only had one opportunity to, to get to the clinic and that was the only opportunity they were going to have, um, what happens in that, in that situation? And, you know, you know does the five-day waiting period have some aspects um, of negative impacts on some women? Um, I maybe will ask me three questions first and then... Well, uh, we'll take that one. Okay. Okay. No, okay. I can answer this question. As long as I get the tree. Yes, we, um, if you look at the, the um, reflection time, 97% uh, of women have a reflection time of more than five days. So there is 3% that actually um, have, and, and this is not for the 40, uh, 44 days, right? This is just after the 44 days, because it's 44 days, you don't have a reflection time. Uh, so, but even th those women in 65% reflect longer than five days. So 35% will, you know, make a uh, decision earlier because they really want that simple procedure and not wait till the pregnancy is further on. However, the women that are further on in, in pregnancy, 3% uh, will have an abortion. So there is an escape. And the, 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 the way they're doing it is that you have to, if you put down like two days or three days, we, um, they will actually ask you for the reasons in the, in the form you have to fill in, but it's not in the report. So I have no idea why, you know, there is, what the reasons are that women actually, but the, you understand, I, I don't know what the reasons are, but physicians will always listen to you. That's my assumption. We'll, we'll, we'll always, and if they see the emergency, they will not. Uh, like the woman's here now, let's help her. That's great, thanks very much. And it, um, it, it, it kind of ties on to that um, last piece around the 44 day waiting period and how that anomaly does exist in the legislation in relation to um, earlier, earlier abortion of up to uh, 44 days. And I'm just wondering, is there any sort of research or understanding of the, you know, how that wait, so the cohort of women that have that waiting period and have the mandatory counselling, and then the women who don't have to have that? And is there any kind of, because you have the two cohorts that one, one bunch has it and one bunch doesn't, and I'm wondering, is there any research done on the experiences of either in terms of their experiences of um, the process, I suppose? Yeah, what I, what I, I do, we don't have any data on that. Uh, Counselling is not mandatory, so okay. you, on, you, what you actually do is that in your interaction with the woman, and while you're questioning her, you have to ask whether there, you know, you have to f basically figure it out whether the woman needs more help. And uh, what we do know, and that's also from literature, but it's also from personal experience mainly, is that um, abortion is always a very good uh, or very, very difficult decision. And you will, if you have your arguments very straight before the event, actually, it's, it's easier to cope with afterwards. So in that respect, the reflection times give you the time to put your act together, to put all your pros and cons, to sort of, and it's, it, this is especially true for people that are confronted with, uh, you know, structure anomalies, chromosome anomalies, if they want to, con if they're considering termination, the first reaction is always like, oh, my baby has this, and I want a termination now. And, you know, I always say, don't do it, you know, because you are actually, you're in a roller coaster, you know, you're in there, and it's a loop, and it's a loop, and it's a loop, and by the end of the day, it suddenly stops, and you've had your termination, you're back home, and you think like, oh my God, what has just happened there? And then it really hits you. So the grieving has to start, the process has to start before you rush into the abortion. You know, it's, it, and... Do I have data on that? Do I have like psychological studies? No, I don't, but I've been counseling women for many, many years now. And 
not once, I've not heard it once, come, a woman coming back to me said, you made me wait. That was so inhuman. They will come back and they'll say, really, it was so, so nice to have the weekend together. We went to do something nice. We had a great weekend. We, you know, we, we thought about it. We discussed it. We talked to her family and we made the decision and we're, I mean, we're sad, we're totally sad, but this is, we made the only right choice. Thanks very much. Um, the last question, I suppose, um, oh, sorry. Yes, maybe follow up on, on the legal aspect of this cohort of the first 44 days. Um, in the um, evaluation of the act in 2005, we said it is an anomaly and the law should be uh, um, adapted and this these 44 days period should be brought within the scope of the law, because now we can be certain about whether there is a pregnancy or not. And the government agreed on that, but it did not take much, many measures to, to, to um, implement that, because they were a bit scared to change, make any change in the law whatsoever, because it was a delicate political compromise and so on. Um, Last year, 2016, the Minister of Health have, has uh, submitted a bill to Parliament, and we refer to that in our position paper, about uh, allowing uh, GPs to um, offer an abortion pill to women who request it. There has been a lot of debate about it, and the bill has been will not go, not go further because the new government doesn't like it. And but in that bill. Um, the situation of the f first 44 days was legalized, so to say, brought under the scope of the act. So maybe in the future, at some time, they, they will do so. Thank you. Um, the last question kind of ties into the next body of work that this committee will take on in relation to the auxiliary recommendations of the Citizens' Assembly. Um, but it's just because you mentioned it in the presentation around mandatory sex education, um, which is something that I support in theory. But unfortunately, in Ireland, the Catholic Church and religion still very much has a monopoly over uh, schools in relation to sexual education. I know from my own experience, I have to remove my 10-year-old daughter so, and I, I remove her from participating um, in some of the organisations that come into the school to give this. So I'm just wondering, could you just give us a small bit of insight into who actually provides the, the mandatory sex education within the schools and what, what is the curriculum um, that, that, that it would be based on? Okay, so I'm not a teacher, but I, so I, I'm talking from personal experience and how we, it was brought to us as parents is that the, the, the teachers actually get you know, their, their program from people that make the program. So they, they're like facilitated of giving sexual educations, but it's the teacher in the classroom that actually provides the, 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 the sex education. Well, you've, you've no, so yeah, so I suppose it would be different, I suppose, to Ireland's because it is it's so religious based. So, in my head, like sexual education should be about positive sexual experiences and negotiated sexual consent and stuff. And would I, I really, I cannot, know. you know, we have we have um, elementary schools in the Netherlands that have a religious background. So, you know, in Catholic, for instance, Jewish, Islamic, and I do, I have no idea whether they all actually do it the way they should because i'm not but i know that it's one of the items that they actually tick off you know when they are asked when they're visited by you know inspections that are do you have a sex you know sexual program thank you thank you uh deputy billy keller was next but he said not to be surprised if he wasn't back after that vote uh, and we i now call on uh, uh deputy hildegard nocton and thank you very much for both your presentations here today. And my question just follows on from Senator Uwans in relation to um, better sex education, awareness around contraceptives and the importance of that. And I suppose, could you just confirm that your, do you believe that your, the number of teenage pregnancies has reduced and the number of teenage abortions has reduced. And I know that the majority would be older women who would be seeking abortions as well. I, I, I note that fact, but just from that point of view, would you, could you confirm that the improvements in sex education 
is a direct result of the decrease in teenage and abortions and pregnancy. Would you see that correlation? Yes, I think one of the one of the things that has changed uh, during the last couple of years, and you can see it in the media, and you can see it on TV, that actually um, talking about sex just has become a very natural, normal thing that people do also on TV. Let's take TV, for example. So there has been... Uh, one of them is retired now, very prominent sexologists who have been constantly, you know, repeating themselves and saying how important it is for people to have a sexual education, not just, you know, to, uh, to, to prevent abortion, you know, to prevent abortion and un unplanned pregnancy, but also for adults to experience an a good and nice and healthy sexual life because that's what it's you know it's important in your life to be happy and have you know all these facilities so you need to know a little bit about it if you want to appreciate it so and once he was there there were more and more sexologists coming and they've been sort of advocating them and they've been going around so it's it's a very natural thing to discuss whether you're in a classroom at your house with your family with your friends it's, it's something that has not come as a taboo. It's out of the taboo thing. It's something we can discuss. Thank you. And just um, finally, a lot of my questions have already been answered, so that's why I only have one other question for you. And thank you for your very comprehensive presentation here today. Just in relation to the five-day waiting period, and I know you don't have data on this, but in the context of an Irish woman travelling to the Netherlands for an abortion, how would that work, sorry, excuse me, in relation to the five-day waiting period for her if she was coming over and she only had a day or two? Are there any, how, again, you may not have the data, but just anecdotally how that would work if she only has one or two days and she comes to Netherlands seeking well, an abortion if there's a five yeah, but day... But it's the woman will have to make an appointment, right? So you, you are here, you, you call up the clinic, you send an email, you say, I really like an abortion. And by the time you're in the Netherlands, you have your five day waiting period. So it's not that you have to physically be present and say, I want an abortion. No, it's the first day you ask for requests an abortion and then the clinics know this this you know they know this they know it's there so they will say well fine we'll book you in for then and then and if the woman shows up then apparently she's been thinking about it and she she's consent consistent in her request and they will pursue with the abortion thank you very much thank you Chair. thank you <clears throat> deputy kate o'connell um Thank you, Chair, and thank you both so much for taking the time to come over here and to attempt to educate us here in Ireland. Um, actually, following on from um, um, Deputy Hildegard Knoxon's question, um, I was going down the route of how um, you as a country demystified um, human reproduction and conversations around sex, so you've sort of gone there with that. Um, have you any suggestions as to how we might try to do that in this country? Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with our history of um, our legacy of incarcerating females in this country, the trade of illegitimate children in this country, um, to homes in Ireland and abroad. We have a damning history when it comes to female rights. Um, I would agree with Deputy Dinaran, probably stemming, probably stemming from the hold of the Catholic Church on our state and our ovaries and all things um, sexually orientated. So um, have you any advice for us? I think if I went to the Minister for Health and said I wanted a team of sexologists, I think he'd say, Lord, I don't know how I'll go. I'll deal with that. So you might be able, you might be able to, to help us in that regard. Um, and. Um, when, when you were dealing with, I mean, one of the issues here, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen it through the questions, I mean, it seems to be very difficult for some people to separate the moral from the medical. And um, we constantly hear conversations about, you know, the rights of the unborn child, and by somehow by removing the Eighth Amendment that w women are just going to take a turn at 36 weeks and go, do you know, I don't even want a child, I changed my mind. So 
I mean, what I'm trying to get is here, uh, what did you do in, in your country? Where did you get pressure from, um, the moral pressure from, when you were doing this back in the day? And um, have you any advice for us on how, how we can do that? And then there's a couple of just rapid questions with... Um, Focus on the... Yeah, we'll come back to you. Yeah. We'll come back to you. Before there was the legislation, and you can probably go into that, you know, there was already, there were already abortions. So there's been, there's, oh, it always starts the way you're starting now. There's also always a couple of people, you know, that think that they have a strong case and that they should fight for it and that they should actually stand up and do something about it. And uh, so we had a, an abortion clinic and we had the Academic Medical Center, which wasn't the Academic Medical Center, but it's, it resulted from that. And they were very strong advocates, actually, for abortion. So they've been performing abortions even before it was legalized. And it was, this is, this is Holland, so, you know, we sometimes have legislation and it's like, you know, it's like we just go along with the flow until it becomes so big and everybody's talking about it and everybody's ready. And then we get a law. But it starts before that. It starts with a, with a couple of people that will actually go against maybe what you should be doing, but they, they, they so strongly feel that they should change things. So you're basically doing it right now. There's a, such a strong feeling that things should change and you cannot come from where you are to our system. It will never work that way. It will go. It will be a very, very slow and long process, and you will need the people, the the fighters out there. And it's maybe you, politicians, but it's it's going to be medical people, maybe volunteers, maybe women who had an abortion, maybe women who never had an abortion, but really feel that this is, you know, maybe men that think that. But it will go. And I don't know else how else to. To, to tell you what to do. I don't have the solution at hand. Um, from where did you, did you decide, and maybe I picked up your presentation wrong, that you didn't don't distinguish between first and second trimester? Um, one of the, did, did I hear it? Oh, you do, sorry, I picked that yes, up wrong, we, excuse me, well, sorry. No. I thought the somebody report, said that. So. The report is, no, I mean, we don't distinguish between, what we actually distinguish uh, between is the report distinguishes between first and second trimester. I don't know why they do it that way. They just do. Uh, what they do distinguish is about that the gestational age until which you can terminate is fetal viability, which is 24 weeks. However, abortion clinics will terminate until 22 weeks. And that stems from the day when we didn't have any very accurate dating. We have now far ac more accurate dating scans and they were really scared that with the variation, and if they would go beyond 22 weeks, that actually they might be terminating a, terminating a feat that, that was further progressed than the 22 weeks. So what you actually see in the Netherlands is that the majority of the termination is in abortion clinic, but at 23 weeks, they're all performed in hospitals. Uh, it's only 127 cases last year, and we assume it's all because of fetal anomalies. I'm and just a, sorry, go ahead. There's a second. There's also not a difference between the first and the second trimester in our law. Uh, abortion clinics do need a special license to be allowed to uh, perform abortions in, in the second trimester. And, but that has mainly to do with the uh, medical complications yeah, and the, the, skills. the skills and the facilities you need to have to do it safely. And just finally, um, I think, and again, maybe I'm, I'm between running in and out, and maybe I've got you wrong, uh, Professor Kievers, but he said the, bro the law deter deters doctors broadly accepted practice. He used that phrase, I think, with regard to the law. What happens if it's broadly accepted practice and then you somehow end up with a very um, conservative government comes in. Well, how would that affect your practice? I'm just putting it out there. If you broadly, if, if, if you're behaving in a sense that's broadly accepted, but it's against the law, and then you have perhaps a very conservative government comes in, what happens in Holland then? Or you oh, haven't thought about uh, that? I probably shouldn't worry about Holland. Every law can be changed. 
it's more difficult to change the constitution, of course, but we don't have anything in the Dutch constitution about abortion. Uh, the law can be changed. So if theoretically, yes, I agree, um, the law could be much more restrictive than it is now. It's unlikely that that will happen because uh, we have had many different government coalitions in the last uh, 35 years. And most of them, for instance, the Christian Democratic Party was, was leading in it, of at least part of it, and the present coalition also, the Christian Party forms part of it. And um, they always have, also those parties always have respected the, the, the balance or the, the, the compromise or however you would call it that has been achieved in that law, in the Abortion Act. So I, I don't expect that, that this will change and I think the majority of the, the Dutch public would be much, uh, well, contrary to such an... Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you both very Thank much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deputy Louise O'Reilly. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you to our guests. And just before my questions, I very much welcome um, Deputy O'Connell's suggestion about the team of sexologists. And uh, in fact, I want to be at that meeting when it is <laughs> proposed. I think we probably all do. Um, with regard to the five-day wait, so I, the, it just the, it, it's not necessary to visit the doctor beforehand you can simply express the wish by email and then wait the five days and then presumably go and and see the doctor thereafter so just with regard to issues of geography um in terms of availability so there will be an ever-increasing number of irish women accessing uh, abortion pills online via women on web um, and you know, some of that obviously is because they, 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 they don't have the, the wherewithal to travel or because they, they, they find out early in their, uh, in their pregnancy, and etc. But I'm just wondering, do, you, do women in the Netherlands access the, the services of, of uh, women on web or do they, they simply don't need it because the, there's enough provision within the state system? And if there is, in terms of geography, how, how do people access the uh, how do people access the, the the clinic or do they is it through their GP is there an issue because there obviously can be issues of isolation even even in countries where uh, abortion care is readily available there still can be women who live outside of the cities outside of the towns uh, so I'm just wondering what your experience of that is uh, the, uh, I, I, I don't know if and how many people, I mean, I've heard about, you know, uh, women on, on the web. So it's, it's, we're all wet, well aware of it. I have no idea about numbers, I have no idea how many people are accessing it. What I do know is that um, in, um, in the Netherlands, all the abortion clinics have a contract with a hospital. So if there is a complication, you have your, you, you know, you have a hospital you can refer to so the hospital can actually deal with your complication. So I don't think there will be any, you know, boundaries for women who have access to internet bills and they have a complication. They can just freely walk into a hospital and we will manage the situation. Thank you. Um, for the, the five-day waiting period in between, uh, would a woman be offered... Counselling. I mean, you, you you very correctly pointed out that that it's not uh, it's it's not it's not an easy decision. Um, obviously, in some countries, it's made significantly more difficult uh, for women. Um, but it, would it be mandatory that a a woman would be offered counselling? Would she have to seek it? Um, would it be available? It's uh, always available, and it's not mandatory. If you give me a minute, I can. Yeah, what I, I what have I meant the was numbers, the, but it's not a hundred percent of the women that have counselling. It's, it's yeah. far less. Yeah, no, I it's meant more like was it mandatory to no. offer it or not mandatory no. to well, have it? Mandatory to it offer depends it. To be, it depends a little bit where you work. I mean, in our hospital, we have the rule that it's mandatory, because, but that's not because we think that the woman has to go through some sort of, you know panel in order to be able to have, but we think it's good medical practice and we think that counselling will help later on to deal with the, with the, with the situation. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and just, I just want to refer to points that were made earlier, and, I, and I'm sorry now that the person that made them isn't in the room, but with regard to the, uh, the directive that would be issued or the information that would be given when uh, a woman may wish to date the, the, the pregnancy and she may wish to avail of a scan, I think there was a suggestion that, uh, that she wouldn't be able to look at the scan, presumably if she asked to see the scan. No, I, what, I, what I'm doing is giving you an opportunity to correct what I think was misinformation that was put on the record. Um, I, I understood from what you said, which I think may have been misinterpreted by another member of the committee, I understood from what you said was that the note goes on really just as a, as a, a note to the person performing the scan, that this is why she's getting the scan, so she may not wish to look. But of course, if the woman wanted to see this, for whatever reason, it, her own choice, if she wanted to see the scan, that would be absolutely OK. Absolutely. That's good. I think it's good that we clear that up. And just, uh, Chair, if I can, just very, very briefly, I did a quick Google there because, again, uh, there was another member of the committee was, uh, was saluting this country for uh, all of the, the Special Olympics and all the work that's done. And I think it's, it's, it's true to say that the Special Olympics is... Uh, is as vibrant in, in the Netherlands as indeed it is. It's an international, uh, it's an international movement. I just think it's important we put that on the record as well. Thank you. Thank you. And our next uh, speaker is uh, Debbie Catherine Murphy. Yeah, and thanks very much. Um, thanks for your presentation. I think it's very useful to get the different perspectives. Um, the, uh, it was said earlier that P Irish people would be horrified at the use of the term undesirable pregnancy. We're, very, we're actually very used to the term crisis pregnancy. I think it's, it's just an issue of language there. I don't think that, uh, uh, and uh, I've got to say I wouldn't be arrogant enough to uh, presume to speak for the entire Irish nation. Um, but the opinion polls have been certainly showing that there is a desire to change our very re re uh, restrictive uh, regime that uh, it only permits uh, an abortion on the basis of uh, an equal right to life. Um, and it brings very much the legal profession into, uh, you know, the uh, in, into the uh, in, in treatment rooms and, and and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to just wanted to say that. I just wondered why um, the choice was made to embed the uh, the legislation in the criminal law as opposed to the whole healthcare uh, area. It is embedded in the whole healthcare area in the sense that uh, many, much health legislation does apply to abortion services. For instance, uh, legislation on patient rights, legislation on quality and safety in healthcare, legislation on the medical professions. So in that sense, it's part of healthcare. When we had this evaluation of the Act in 2005, there were, was part of the uh, abortion specialists or physicians who came forward and sent us a letter saying uh, we want you to consider in your recommendations that we are already subject to so much other legislation. Why uh, can't we go out of the criminal system, to put it in, in, in this way, and uh, do you really, really need to have this criminal code context? Um, well, we didn't, um, as in our study, we didn't make such a recommendation. And if we had done so, I'm sure that it would not have been accepted by, by politics and by the Dutch parliament, by government. Because, as I said before, um, under Dutch law, yes, unborn life is considered to deserve some degree of protection. And uh, it makes sense to that that protection is also provided by means of criminal law. So I, I would be very surprised if in the foreseeable future this would change and abortion would be taken out of criminal law. At the same time, abortion as it is performed in practice is not, does not have the burden or the association of a criminal act as you may have yeah. understood from what is you being know, said by us. I understand that, and yeah. there's a very 
clear uh, difference between what happens here. Uh, can I just ask then, in relation to uh, the, you know, the majority of abortions happen in, in abortion clinics, um, in hindsight, is does does that produce problems? Because we've heard from psychologists that you know, you know, stigma, uh, protests outside. Does it draw that? Would it be better embedded in hospitals, or is it? Is, is that the experience in the Netherlands? It's no, not, we, no. you know, no, we have. Uh, no, I mean, I know, I have a, I have a daughter who lives in Texas, and there's always people outside of the abortion clinic pr protesting. I haven't seen a protest in front of an abortion clinic uh, in ages, and I live very close to one. And it's, as, as you know, as, as a chef says, I mean, it's embedded in the criminal law. But women are not criminalized. So, and it may be contradictory, but if you had an abortion, let's say we're, we're at a party and you know, we, we meet and we discuss that we were here, and it would be very, I, I could easily say, if it, you know, if it was that case, I would say, well, I had an abortion. It's not something that you would be judged upon. It's a normal, it's, you know, it's like people say, well, I had a miscarriage. And I say, well, I, when I, I had an award, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. Fine. That's, that's fine. I just wanted, um, and just finally, uh, we had some uh, uh, we had some people yesterday talking to us from the British uh, service and um, pregnancy service, and uh, essentially uh, they were saying that even though there is a, a you know, there is a regime and there are lots of there's lots of, of, of centres people are not terribly far from uh, services they some people are availing of um, uh, you know medication online um, uh, is that the experience or is there any experience of that in the Netherlands? I have no numbers no I really, I really okay. don't I really don't know but um, I, re I really don't know okay fine thank you thank you uh, Deputy Claire Daly Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for coming in. I think for all of us, it's given us, I suppose, a very different view, uh, maybe, and it is striking, the woman-centred approach. But yet, at the same time, there are other things that would maybe seem a little bit contradictory. But maybe ju just a couple of, of, of quick points. Um, I think there's been a consistent attempt here, and, and you saw evidence of it today, to use disabled people or people with disabilities in order to support an anti-abortion stance. Now, I think your figures on Down syndrome were quite good, but my read of the statistics that you gave, and maybe you could go over them, is because there's an attempt also to link um, prenatal screening also to sort of being some sort of a, an attempt to eliminate uh, the population of anybody with a disability. But from my read of your figures, and you might because it is hard to do, that actually prenatal diagnosis has had no impact on the abortion rate, but does have an impact on late abortions. Would that be a correct read of it? That I think yes. the f I think you see that second part correctly. I think it, and that's why I'm so a little bit. Uh, that's why I would like the numbers to be better because I would like. It you know, the numbers to actually co be, the, if it would be able to correlate it, like this was prenatal diagnosis and this was, but so all we can do is that we've seen, you've seen it in my graph, you've seen an increase of late second trimester abortions and the only assumption we can make that that might be due to the 20 week scan because that's when the anomalies get picked up. And if it's a severe, it's a severe anomaly, you know, parents will consider termination. So I think you see that reflected in the numbers, yes. But I, I think this is 3.3% after a scan of the overall abortions take place after a scan. I mean, scanning is used No, 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 no. the 3.3 is, of, I was saying that it's, it's, it's a thousand women that have a, uh, is that not correct? No, no. It's, it's a, it was a, no, it's, it's just a figure that was saying that in, in, in 2015, that of all of the abortions, yes. all three of them, point through. only all three of, them. of all of them, only three point exactly percent of them are after a scan. In other words, the the no. impact. Of we don't know when they were, but the, the only three point three were after prenatal diagnosis, and we can only assume. So that's what I say. Scan. Is that you know the this report actually says we can only assume that the prenatal diagnosis 
was not made in those first 44 days. So they say, so thus the number of pregnancy term is 4.6 percent. I don't think that's a correct way of looking at things because I'm, I work out there and I know how long it takes to make a prenatal diagnosis. So before you actually get a diagnosis, well, let's say you're 12 weeks, most likely you're 13 weeks. So I think those terminations are all late terminations. In terms of um, the figure was given as well, um, and again, I know we, we, we have to use statistics and evidence, but no. I suppose comparing, it's quite a different model in some ways than, than Britain, which is something we're more familiar with here. But at the same time, the figures we've been given for Britain is that 92% of terminations take place at less than 13 weeks. The figures given for the Netherlands was 81% at less than 13 weeks. Now, I know you have a very high number under seven weeks. Uh, but is, is there a reason for that? or How would we explain that difference? Which difference are you referring to? The 81 Between the, to the, the, the 90? The terminations in the, in the UK, more terminations take place under 13 weeks than they do in the Netherlands. No, Most we have 81%. The, they have 92%. I don't know. Why is that? Yeah, no, I, I just... I don't know. I just... I think that women who, you know, I think that women that are considering a, an, an, an abortion, you know, now today it's, it's easy, you know, you get a pregnancy test in, in, anywhere and so people will know earlier on when they're pregnant and they, if they consider abortion, they will do it as, as soon as possible. But I don't know why there is no, a 10% no, no, difference curious, between us just, and the Just, just and very the briefly on, on, on the criminalization yeah. and I know... Well, um, when we did this evaluation in 2005, we found that uh, the, the number of second trimester abortions was relatively, relatively high, not, not high in absolute numbers, but uh, because of um, women coming from countries where there was a strict 12 weeks limit. Um, but the, the statistics we have now it's difficult to say whether this is still the case. Oh, yes, Maybe, it's, it's, but... Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, just in terms of, of the whole area of criminalisation, because the, the need to decriminalise in Ireland has been a, a regular feature at this committee, because evidence has been given across the board from the medical profession that it causes a real chilling effect on our medical practice here. That doesn't seem to exist there. Is there any sanction? I mean, basically what you're saying is it's criminal. But it's not really. It's only criminal if it doesn't, if it takes place in outside a, a, a licensed premises. Well, actually, it's embedded within the criminal law to to protect the women, and it's actually embedded in the criminal law. Actually, so if there would be doctors out there that are doing stuff that is illegal or is not within their medical ethical, you know, framework we can actually deal with those doctors. So it's not within the criminal for the woman, it's there for the doctor. It's a completely different way. It's, so we doctors actually do it in a nice and licensed way. Is that correct? It's, it's not to yeah. criminalize the woman. It's more to protect the woman from potential it's kind of criminalising illegal abortions, I suppose, or yes, backstreet yes. abortions, so and it provides yes. a certain protection for women. Yes. In that, there's no sanction. For, for women? Yeah, no. No, yeah, okay. No, no. Never. Uh, that, that is important because I think your whole model, which is, as I say, striking, is, is the idea of careful decision-making, which is timely in light of what we discussed here uh, yesterday. I, I was struck by your point that... Uh, everybody's circumstances are different. And I suppose you said that the necessity or what you identified, which I think supports this as a really good model actually, of having non-specific language. Because how do you put in a law all of the myriad of many different conflicting or competing reasons that somebody, so is, is that something that you would maybe recommend to us or, or how would you, you've found great, I suppose, benefit from having that? non-specific language. It's difficult to make recommendations for, for others, so we must be uh, reluctant to do so. But I, I think that what is important that uh, the system we have is more responsive to, to the many different situations in which women can find themselves and in, in situations of despair and so on. But that's, so, how, it's, but that's yeah. how it's written down. Yeah. So it's, it's actually illegal 
unless there is a crisis in the woman. So the request comes from the woman, and she has she's in despair, and it's and it's written down. It's I don't know how you translate it. It's no situatie. It's like I'm in an emergency crisis, and I really don't see any other way out. So it's taking the whole uh, state of the woman. It's it's medically, but it's also medically, like psychologically, which is also can be a huge burden. Very individual. An emergency is a very individual thing. What could be an emergency yeah. for one yeah. person would not yes. be for... Just in terms of, of consent, because I, I think it is the key to your your issue, but the whole area of medical treatment is based on the consent of, of the patient or, or the person at the heart of it to accept treatment or to indeed refuse treatment. Very much so, yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, in, in, in Ireland, our medical ethics are based on that, with the exception and it's specified actually in our health policy, with the exception of pregnant women in cases where it's perceived there is a risk to the, the fetus. Um, our midwives and, and representatives from our health service have told us that that has created a, a climate of fear in terms of medical uh, care and so on, and a coercion on the medical um, profession to have to seek a legal opinion with their patient. Is that something you would have ever come across in any scenario that to your... No. Well, there is actually, I don't know if I understand you correctly, um, as a as a, a physician, what are your gynecology or, you know, and you have, you know, I have my own ethical framework. So if I would be opposed to abortion and a woman comes to me with the request for an abortion, I do not have to perform it myself, is that what you're saying? But you have to refer the person to a professional who is willing to help the woman. It's actually come up, say, if you were my doctor and did a pregnancy and you wanted me to have, say, a cesarean section, and I felt, no, I wanted a, a natural delivery and so on, and that then it would basically say, well, I, I as your doctor, believe that um, you might be jeopardising oh. the baby, so you're, you can't, I am compelling you to have a cesarean section. We can't do that. We, and we, I know it's, it's, it's when I was in the UK. It happened a couple of on a couple of occasions, and um, there is actually, but maybe you would know that there is a possibility if you really, really think there is a big danger for the fetal life, and there is this thing where you can, at the mouth, you know, you can sort of dispose the woman out of parental custody for like an hour, and then you know, but yeah, that, you might do that with people that are like psychiatric or something that you really think you know they're seeing that there is Jesus somewhere in the room you know I don't think they will but there will otherwise no way if you don't want a c-section even if the if even if it would result in a dead baby you are not allowed to do it well, that's very helpful thank you yeah. Thank you. We have two more speakers, and I want to. I'm, I'm watching the, the the screen behind me at the same time, and it's getting uh, uh, precarious. Uh, Debbie Reed Smith. Okay. Well, I'll try and be as quickly as possible to prevent any more precarity in this room. Um, just, uh, I was interested in your submission about the reasons, and they are. Um, difficult decisions that women make about uh, whether or not to have an abortion. And um, I, I was interested in the list of reasons that you gave as an example. Financial housing, age, whether the family is complete or not, uh, broken or fragile relationships, lack of possibilities of raising a child. And I guess uh, in this discussion that we've been having here, looking at the future, for the, hopefully the future for abortion rights in this country, um, we would have classified that group of reasons as, as socio-economic. And I'm very interested to see that you did not know where did you list some of the things that cause the most discussion in this country, like rape, incest, fatal fetal abnormality, the risk to the life of a woman or the risk to the health of the woman or suicidation. You didn't list them. So I just want to ask you, as an obstetrician and your professor in your field, would you consider these latter risks that I, I listed there as being almost automatic? There would be no discussion, but if a woman said, I've been raped and I want an abortion, that that would not be uh, a, 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 an issue of discussion. Or um, there's been incest in a family and a young girl has been pregnant as a result. 
um, or fatal fetal abnormality. Do you like? Can you look at those and say one measures up against the other? Because it strikes me from having been listening to all of the experts we've had, and we've had some fantastic experts, that the biggest bulk of reasons why, and this would be borne out in my own experience, why women choose to terminate a pregnancy is the socio-economic reasons. And that those other reasons, rape, incest, fatal fetal, or, thankfully are the exception. And so therefore, if a society is to move to liberalise abortion for women to give them choice, that the socio-economic have to be strongly considered as a, a reason for women being given access to termination. I'm just oh, asking I, for I, you. I absolutely agree. I think you, you're, you're saying a couple of things. You're saying like, we see, like we call it, we call it, in Holland we call it a medical abortion, but medical was confusing. So basically uh, uh, an abortion for medical reasons, they can be, two ways, it could be either because the fetus has a medical condition or because the mother has a medical condition and it would be unsafe to carry on with the pregnancy, even you know, if, she, if she's psychiatric and suicidal, then that would be one of the reasons we call it. You know. Now, there has been um, a long discussion about that latter one, when the mum's life is really in danger, and in the latest evaluation, that one is now outside of the criminal law. So if it's mandatory to say, if it's mandatory to, to perform an abortion in order to save the woman's life, you don't even have to blink it, you don't have to wait, you can just do it and there will be no repercussions whatsoever. All the other things are we call social indications. So you call it social economic, we call it social. So whether it's rape, incest, housing, whatever, it's all under social. So rape is under socio-economic as well, yes, as housing and work. Yes, and but what we would like, and that's the way, of the, like if it's rape and incest and you come across it, and this is where I was, where you were asking, like, is psychological help mandatory? Now, in these, if, if we would find out that there was this incest and rape, we would strongly insist on having these patients we wouldn't do the abortion, that's not the case, but we would strongly suggest to help the woman to, to, to get counselling, to use health, you know, youth care, what do you, whatever they would need. Yeah. Absolutely, because you want to prevent it from happening again. And you want, the other thing, you also want to protect the woman from going back to the, you know, abusive, abusive, abusive yeah. environment. So you, you really would put all effort in, in, in helping these women and not just by, you know, sending them to an abortion clinic, yeah. get it over with, and then, well, go on and deal with your life. Here's, here's the pill. Yeah. So there's different categories. Basically, what I'm teasing out is that because we're moving, hopefully, to a situation where we will be, you know, fingers crossed for all of us, I think, who remain in this room at the moment, that we'll be in a position to get rid of the ban, the constitutional ban on abortion in this country. I'm sure you're aware as a lawyer that there is a constitutional ban. If that was removed, then we have to look at legislation. So basically what I'm trying to tease out is the, the um, distinction between what we call socio-economic, what you call social, and these other horrible and hopefully very rare cases. And that if you were to only allow for the horrible and hopefully very rare cases, then you still have an extremely prohibitive abortion regime. Would, would that be your view? Yes, you know, what I think is, what, what you're, what you're, otherwise what you're trying to do is come up with reasons why one reason would be a better reason than the other reason. You know, let's, for instance, you know, I'm, 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 I'm 45, I have five kids, and they're all in, in university, and suddenly I'm pregnant. You know, that could be a very good reason for me to say, well, oh my God, I don't want to start over again. On the other side, I am, you know, super poor. I have two small kids living in one tiny bedroom apartment with, you know, this is what you come across. I mean, it's really, it's, desperate stories. It's never stories that people say, oh, if that's what I said, it's not a light decision. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, when I made my opening statement, you know, there's, there is really a difference between unplanned and unwanted. You know, some women get pregnant unplanned and they come and they say, oh, it was unplanned, but it's really very wanted, you know, so.
you know, people do deal with unexpected situations. It's not like they all run, a, a, you know, across the road and have an abortion. If, if, if you didn't have to, it would be yes. a great one. But um, it, I'm just following on from that, I just want to explore what anti-choice people or people who are against abortion would argue is the abortion industry. And I'm interested to see that in the Netherlands moment, there the majority of Irish people who do uh, try to uh, attend in the Netherlands for an abortion attend these clinics called CASA clinics. There's seven or eight of them, and they're bankrupt at the moment. Now, I can see that they charge between um, uh, three and 500, three, somewhere between 350 and 500 euro for an abortion. There are those who would say in Irish society that there's an abortion industry out there and that this abortion industry is targeting vulnerable women. And in all of the, all of the material we have read and that has been set here in front of us, um, tar being targeted by the abortion industry has never been listed as a reason for an abortion. <laughs> so, if there's an abortion industry in Holland, and also I note the way women are entitled to a free abortion in Holland as long as you're insured and legal in the country. Uh, however, if there's an industry in Holland, it's bankrupt at the moment, uh, and, and I, I possibly given there's a lot of free... There, I don't know, reason, maybe there's a lot of corruption there? Well, the reason they're bankrupt is because they had, they had to pay back a lot of money. No, the, it's actually a question about billing. It's the way they were... It's it's we don't know what happened it's under investigation so i have no more data than than you have and what we read in the newspapers um, the only thing i know is that a couple of those clinics has to close and it's putting an enormous str uh, st uh, st stress on all the other ones and we're seeing that but it's you can say it's an industry, but there have been, uh, what do you call, you know, up billing. You get a certain amount of money for a certain procedure. I s told you all the procedures. So one of them is a more, uh, what I think, eh, it's an assumption, is that one procedure is a bit more expensive than the other one, and they said that they did A while they were doing B. Okay, thanks for that. So, but, I mean, it has nothing to do with their professionalism or how they were doing it. There's no, uh, no... No you know, no malpractice okay. there. Okay, thanks for that. Um, one kind of final question, or probably one and a half last questions, is that um, the early abortions are most common, under 13 weeks, 81%, which is very, very good. Is that largely due to the use, the increased use of the abortion pill? Or is that, uh, you know, that you can take a pill early on now and you're not, you don't have to go through the surgical abortion? Or would you distinguish... In, in, in those stats between the two things. And then the half a question I'd like to answer, because I don't suspect you'll want to answer it, I'd like to ask you, that if you closed your eyes and you just landed here, that you didn't know you had to come to Ireland to speak to a parliamentary committee about our future, what would you think of the state of abortion care for women in this country? What would be your impression, both as a professor in law and as a professor in obstetrics? It's difficult, uh, yeah. I, I can't give an opinion about the state of abortion care because I don't, I'm not familiar. But what I can see is, is the, the legal context. And that is, if you compare it with other countries in Europe, for instance, it's very restrictive. And uh, if you look at the uh, European Convention of Human Rights and the court decision that had have been taken in the course of the years. Uh, you see that the European Court has been very reluctant to go into this issue, what should prevail, the choice of the woman or the, the protection of the unborn life. But even so, you, there's some movement towards acknowledging that, uh, well, there is a growing consensus in, in Europe that there should be more openness and, and possibility for a woman to have an abortion in certain circumstances. And then, of course, you have the discussion when, and, and you mentioned the socioeconomic reasons and so on. Um, so, yes, um, maybe you will move towards a more moderate regime in the future. I, I can't say that. Yeah. And what do you think as a professor of obstetrics? <coughs> how the abortion care should be organised. Or the lack of it. Now, what would you think of the Irish abortion system? Or lack of it? Well, 
I think I don't have to say that out loud. I think you probably know what I feel about it. I, I'm very, I'm a very strong believer in well, what I said is that in women, women's choice and women's reproductive choices, and I really think that women are the only people. I'm not. I'm not disrespecting the men in this whole thing, but I do feel that it's a, it's a female thing. Thank you. Very Thank, much. You. Thank you. We have, we have two more speakers now, actually. We, we have uh, Deputy Anne Rabbit and we have uh, Deputy Lisa Chambers as well. So uh, we, we're going to make a fair attempt, if we can, close the gap between now and, and the, the deadline. I'm supposed to be over there uh, five minutes ago. I'm not going to ask any, any questions Sorry. that's been asked already. Um, I probably am going to lead on from where Deputy Smith was in relation to the socio-economic. And it's a question I would have asked of a previous speakers that have come in, and it's to do with children in care. Um, these are children that are in foster care or in residential care, and I'm just wondering, how do you address that through the legal framework in your country? When they have to make a decision if a teenager finds themselves pregnant or a young adult finds themselves pregnant and there's a care order for them in this country um, if they need to are, are in that position that they, they so wish to have an abortion there has to be um, a full sitting of a court sitting so earlier on we I have the same rights as everybody else there is, you know, whether it's a parent or whether it's a guardian or whether, whatever you call it. Yeah, but in this country, according to Justice Lefoy and the other senior counsel we had in, they explained to us that they actually have to go before the courts and that's, that brings it on to, term, to gestation times. It prolongs the gestation time. It was a question, it was a number of weeks ago, and it's something, because I'm spokesperson for children, and children in care is a huge issue, because we have 6,300 children in care in this country, and somebody has to articulate these questions on their behalf, and that's why I'm asking the question, how do you address that legal side of it? Because, yes, there's guardianships, but still at the same time, there's different court orders in place as to how their care can be administrative. Do you come across that in your country? And if you do, how you address it? Um, to my knowledge, we don't come across this, um, but it, it may be an issue. Yes, I can see that. Uh, we don't have special rules for, for this. Uh, I would say, if I look at the, our legislation in general, that abortion is looked upon as a highly personal decision, the request for abortion. And, and the main issue would be whether the, the woman or the girl in question would be competent, yes or no, if she is. And if she is 12 years or older and she, um, she is entitled to make a request. And if she has a guardian who doesn't agree, depends very much on the circumstances. Uh, basically, uh, if she insists on that request and if the health professional f feels that he can go along with her request, she will have this abortion. It's the same as with those parents which, whose consent is not needed in, a, in, in special circumstances. But you do not have to go to court. You do not to, have to go to court. You do not have no. because you have a guardian. You do not have to get to court in order to be able to get an abortion. Yeah. The, the, you have to go to court here is because the, there's a ban on abortion. The state has a ban on abortion, yeah. except in certain circumstances. So, hence the, the origin of, of the question. Yeah, and these are the children who, who haven't got the freedom to travel. Anybody else in a similar crisis Correct. situation yes. would travel. Yes. So that's yes. Yeah. yes. But once you have legislation, they would fall under everything else, right? They would have the same rights as anyone. It's just one of those ones that I myself find there's going to be a huge challenge around it. It's to do with children in care and how it's going to be addressed. And the last day when we had our own legal professionals in front of us, um, they clearly told me the process at this moment in time. And I just don't know from a legislative point of view, going forward, how we can address this particular anomaly that's in the whole system, because it, it, it's going to be a huge issue. All right. I will also have to say, which um, I did find your presentation um, 
a little bit shocking, or actually a lot shocking, because children at 12 years of age making, maybe it's reality out there it is, because you're after telling me that children at 12 years of age making decisions about abortion or 14 years of age and not in having the support or linking or telling their parents or anything like that, I did find they can make the choice without the, the, the without permission, without the engagement factor. I find I find that comment on that? Yeah, I'd like you to, yes. Yes, because that is, I would like to comment on that in the same way I commented on the incest and the rape issue, mm -hmm. is that if we see these young girls, I mean, not me, but, you know, the doctors, we, we always try to address these things, you know, and maybe there is, what I'm, what I am saying is that maybe we had 83 teenagers, okay, between, be, below 15 last year, 83, it's in there, yeah. So it's like below 100, it's been dropping. If we see that, we, if we think there is a problem, we will always, always seek assistance and we will always try to figure out what's going on and if there is a way of, of um, helping the girl. What I'm referring to is that if the, the girl in question would actually have been the victim of incest, for instance, and there is a threat to her life if she, if she comes out with it or if she says she's pregnant within her, this is where we're talking about. I'm, I'm not saying everyone below 15 does, I mean, the majority will probably come with the mom and dad or either or both or whatever. I'm saying that there are scenarios, and I think you can imagine them as well as I can, is that you really think if I if I disclose this to the outside world, the life potentially of this girl is in danger, and it's worse than seeking help and advice and support the other way around. Thank you. Thank you for expanding on that. And the last question, and it's not a question, it's really a commentary on it. We've had a lot of speakers in here, and it's about coercion or persuading people for termination or persuading persons for not to have a termination, I need to ask the question, when they were to present at your, at your clinic, um, do you persuade them that, yes, this is the right decision, they should go through it, or do, what is your involvement? Oh. Very neutral, actually. I think our counselling is very neutral. I think it's all about... Um, what, how I'm always uh, saying it to parents, you know, when I, when we offer counselling, you know, I, we're, we're, I always say it's not that we think you're crazy, that we think you need counselling, but we, I think it's very important for you to balance all the, the pros and cons in order to be able to make an info and it's all about informed choice. And I, what I said before, it doesn't matter what I think, I'm, I'm just the healthcare provider, so... That's what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Lisa Chambers, the very last. Yes. Somebody had to be last. Somebody has to be last, and it's me today. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming here, for travelling to, to, to be here with us today and, and to make presentations and, and to take questions. Um, from a legal perspective, just putting on your, your legal hat, our current, current law, as you know, guarantees the equal right to life of the mother and the unborn. Legally, what would be your legal opinion as to the difficulties that poses, or why you wouldn't agree with that equation? We have a vote. We have a vote coming up as well. So this time, we're going to, if, if if nobody objects, we'll try and finish if it's possible. Yeah, is that um, okay? I would not agree with this equation. As I've said before, um, we consider the the unborn not as a person. Yes. He, the, the unborn life um, is entitled to some degree of protection and more if in, in a further stage of development. But only after birth, he or she receives the full, the full protection a person receives. So no such an equation would be accepted. Yes, yeah, so it's not that you disregard the unborn. You have gestation limits in place. You have a regulated service. You offer counselling. There is a reflection period of five days. And obviously there are checks and balances in place to ensure yeah. things are done. And the time limit also to abortion, 24 weeks, yeah. for instance. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to, our, to our visiting witnesses. I want to thank you particularly for being so patient and the numerous interruptions we had, and to thank you for your for your replies to the various questions. We are much indebted to you. You know the stats in relation to Down syndrome, how you say that as many people don't abort when they discover that they have a child. Have you got stats on that? Because I or no, we have no. I, I have. Oh, I only have them for. I, 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 I looked it up for my own region. Yes. We have the data. So what I was actually referring to is that if you have a diagnosed baby with Down syndrome, I, I, I was a bit. It's over a little bit over 80 percent that will terminate. 10% will, you know, disease during pregnancy because even if people carry on, some of them will die in, in, before they're born and 10% will be live born. What I was referring to, this is a group of people that want screening because there is a big group out there that even if you, let's say, have signs of Down syndrome and you say, well, this child could have Down syndrome, you address it, they will say, okay. I will not have an intervention. I don't want prenatal diagnosis, and they just go along with it. And that's why I said our maternal age has been increasing. So maybe we have been terminating more down babies, but it's thank, stable. Thank you very much, and thank, thank you, of the members of the committee, likewise, for your questions and your patience and your tolerance. Meeting. This session is now adjourned.